Today, we're hosting our fellows teaching course, Save a Life, focusing on unusual causes of myocardial infarction. A date stem today is the 2nd September, Thursday, 5 p.m. Singapore time. This event is organized by the APSC, supported by the Singapore Cardiac Society, EPSIC, CME accredited by EBEC, as well as the Singapore SMC, supported uh, by Medtronic. My name is Jack, your chair for and moderator for this exciting session, the current president for APSC. We're very privileged to have our speaker, Professor Tan Wee Chim, who is a cardiologist at the National University Heart Center, as well as a chair for the Singapore Heart Foundation. This is in line with his series of narration of cases for unusual causes of AMI in his 25 years experience in the cath lab itself. Our panelists include Dr. Rosli Muhammad Ali, interventional cardiologist at CV Central Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, as well as Dr. Sydney Lowe, chair elect for the Interventional Council at the Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand, a practicing senior interventional cardiologist at Liverpool Hospital, Australia. We have two fellows to put to the grill today. Uh, one is Dr. Patrick Pander from the Liverpool Hospital Interventional uh, Fellow. He tells me he spent the last six months uh, doing volunteer work in Port Moresby as a cardiologist uh, in Papua New Guinea, as well as Dr. Mohamed Nasril, a clinical fellow from IGN Malaysia. Housekeeping and uh, some disclaimer, the content of this webinar is copyrighted by the APSC. The views and opinions expressed are those of the faculty and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. This event is currently made uh, available by live stream through Wonder, APSC, Facebook, and YouTube pages. CME points will be submitted for those who are connected throughout the whole duration. You will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent by email. A pitch for upcoming webinars for APSC 29 September, we have a follow-up APSC Journal Club where we are trying to show how journals should be analyzed by training fellows across the region. 15 October, 2021, we have a follow-up APSC Care Flight Workshop with a focus on small vessel disease interventions. Let me state the objectives for today. We want to look out and not miss unusual causes of acute myocardial infarction that can be life-threatening. We want to learn and share experiences from the experts. We want to keep these sessions really interactive and open. There are really no stupid questions, so please ask away. And uh, so let's get started and I'll welcome Professor Tan Wee Chim to narrate to us his series of three cases. Thanks, Prof. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come on to this particular session. I've always enjoyed uh, running this program. And that uh, what I want to do here, or, well, this is actually the fourth already of the uh, series of unusual courses of EMI that I'm doing. And so I'm going to start off today with just uh, one case, uh, one ECG, then followed by two cases for discussion. And I just want to show this uh, particular ECG here. This is a 50-year-old Chinese male who has uh, risk factors of hypertension, smoking, and it came in with two hours of chest pain. So we're going to again take a pause and uh, maybe ask Patrick first. Uh, maybe you can narrate to us this ED ECG. What, what, what are your thoughts? Importantly, okay. which is the corporate vessel you think? Thank you. It's an ugly ECG for sure. It's in sinus. The glaring abnormality is ST elevation. It involves septal anterior and lateral, so V1 to V6. But you're, And you have some reciprocal changes. AVL has some subtle ST depression, potentially in lead one. But to be fair, even inferiorly, the J point is not normal. There's some J point elevation. So some global ST changes, predominantly septi septal uh, lateral. So uh, Patrick, can I just ask you uh, the follow-up question from Professor Tan? Looking at this, you have both anterior and inferior ST elevation. Which is the culprit vessel? I think it's going to be a proximal LAD. I say that with a likely a wrap around to the apex involving the inferior to explain it. You could also consider left main, but you don't have any ST elevation AVR. But given the, the amount of ST elevation, particularly septal anterior, 
potentially this could be explained by a wraparound LED supplying part of the inferior wall. Uh, Dr. Nasru, anything else to add on to that? Uh, I think I, I agree with uh, Dr. Patrick. I think it looks like most likely it's involving the proximal LED. Most likely it's a type 3 LED which wraps around the apex, I think, because it involves the inferior leads as well. So, yeah, I agree with Dr. Can I now? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Nasru. Can I now just go to a quick profesh, professorial opinion here? Um, Sydney, do you agree with your fellows? Sorry, I muted. So I think that they have made a very reasonable, uh, and I would agree. Uh, most this is like a tombstone sign, isn't it? And um, so quite Marcus elevation. Interestingly, uh, in lead two, it looks more saddle shaped. But I would think that uh, yes, SC segment elevated, most likely my kind of function, most likely LED, and um, wrap around uh, to the inferior wall. Not unreasonably, but of course, it's an unusual case. And when you know there's an unusual case, we have to think about a bit other things. There's always not all C's, not all, all ST segment elevation is myocardial infarction. Particularly, we see young people presenting and we have to consider. But once you shoot the angiogram and don't see anything, the other question is: is there a misdissection or is some sort of myocarditis, some other reason why ST is dramatically elevated? Or we have seen severe endothelial dysfunction with vasospasm. So my, my thoughts are this, uh, since it's unusual causes, generally speaking, if I have two territories that's both elevated, I tend to think maybe of other causes rather than, it's very reasonable here for anterior wrap around uh, apex, inferior wall type of LED, but in general, uh, anterior ST elevation would have reciprocal ST depression in the inferior leads. And if it's very proximal, you tend to have a high lateral ST elevation one AVL rather than a depression. So here, since it's unusual, I'll think of electrolyzed some yeah. form of myopericarditis as the differential. Which uh, maybe yeah. you can perhaps uh, you don't mind if I would just to add yeah, on this. I would agree, but it's also interesting to note that this patient has got uh, sinus bradycardia. At the same time, there's uh, also inferior leads which were elevated. Sometimes, uh, and this is not uncommon. You actually have one vessel which is totally occluded, and it's supplied by the contralateral uh, vessel. And then that vessel undergoes an infarct. So now you have actually two territories which are then affected. So there's a possibility that, uh, you know, uh, um, perhaps in this case, for example, an LED which is totally included, supplied by the right, but now you have a right which is infarcted, and then you have two territories that now show that there is now acute uh, uh, infarct changes. So that's one possibility. Yeah, that's also a very good uh, teaching point that Rosli uh, brought up, which we sometimes see. Uh, which in please? Yeah, so just wanted to highlight here is that the ST elevation is B1 is a little bit unusual. You, you know, you know, when patient with anterior AMI, you don't see this kind of ST elevations uh, in B1, even if it's got the proximal LED archery. In this same patient who whose ECG was taken in emergency room, I brought him up to the cat, uh, CCO. This is like 25 years ago. So we have to give tomolytic therapy at a time. Just bring him back to CCO. About five, 10 minutes later, this is uh, his next ECG. Okay. So uh, Patrick, again, we'll start with you. Um, is this Congress? You have the initial ECG followed by this one. Yeah, striking changes. There's certainly the bradycardia has resolved. It's now a sinus tachy. There's a replacement of the anterior ST elevation, it's more posterior. There's a deep ST depression, again, V1 to V6, horizontal. Pres there's persistence of that ST elevation inferiorly. You see 2, 3 AVF. Um, and those, the lateral leads, again, very deep horizontal ST depression. So potentially, this is an inferior posterior infarct. I'm not sure how to tie it all together. I did love the thought of a, of a dual, le dual lesion with a CTO and maybe the right secluded, but this now looks to have developed into an inferior posterior STEMI. So any comments from anyone to add on? So usually in Rosalie's scenario of double jeopardy with one vessel occluded and supplied, usually I think one of the clinical features is how sick is the patient. Usually if you're having large anterior STEMI or you're having a double jeopardy scenario, they are not very well. Now the heart rates increase here, still sinus, and, and sort of the is posterior lateral 
SEL elevation, the ST segment inferiorly is not as pronounced as previous. It was not, and now it's more posterior lateral. So it's interesting. I don't know necessarily what to make of it. I don't know what to make of this serial trend of SE elevation anterior inferior, then now transiting to this. I agree, it does look more like MI inferior posterior pattern. But at the back of my mind, when you have this, uh, other differential may include a massive primary embolism as well. Um, Rosley, you have anything else to add? Not really, nothing. I'll, I'll be interested to AGC. I, I still feel it's most uh, quite likely still a possibility of double WDS as you mentioned it's it. For, Again, for, massive, for massive PE, you might expect right axis deviation, but uh, it, it's sort of not that. And, and also the presentation of a PE is, is, you know, he had bradycardia just now rather than, you know, uh, tachycardia. So it's also very unlikely. So I'd like to ask Nasru if he's a clinical fellow at the bedside and you only have ECG, what, what other stuff would you like to do? Uh, an echo, actually. Uh, I would like to do a bedside echo. I think that would give us an indication, uh, you know, which territory is involved, uh, whether it's a global ischemia, whether it's, a, you know, a depressed LV, whether it, it would possibly also give us uh, an answer whether this is PE, you know, looking at the right side of the heart. Um, yeah, so I would probably do an echo, most likely, yeah. Nasru, in uh, IGN, would you thrombolize this patient based on this ECG? Uh, in IGN, we have uh, a, a primary PCI service, so we'll probably bring him to the cath lab uh, for an angiogram, most likely, yeah. So, so perhaps I would suggest that something really weird, so if you had a coronary embolism that went into the proxal AD or left main, and then, then it actually migrated more in the circumflex that's dominant, maybe this is a scenario. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's, that's unusual, but that's entirely possible. I think Huichin is going to show us something amazing. So I, I mean, Huichin, please. It's a real wow, uh, wow, wow, uh, real, real imagination here. But uh, that, let's just keep to this uh, inferior MI looking. Uh, the question here, whenever we do a uh, have an inferior MI, is does this patient have RV infarct as well? Remember, this is a very dynamic ECG changes we are witnessing here. It's just a few minutes and it's changing. Mm -hmm. Does this patient has RV infarct and how do we prove it? That's my so, question. Uh, Hello. Patrick, if you are suspecting RV infarction, is this 12 lead ECG enough? Uh, it's a tough call. I mean, in terms of inferior estivation, three is greater than two. This is more subtle than our first ECG, which would more favor an RCA culprit. Again, there's ST depression lead one. So yes, thinking a right dominant could explain it. Everything comes back to an ECG tells a a thousand words, but your bedside examination is really going to help you. And certainly that's going to be affected by your hemodynamic assessment. We note he's now got a, a progressive tachycardia, but correlating it with your blood pressure, his GCS, whether he's cold, clammy, shut down and, and developing shock, which would be a concern with this alarming ECG. And it's important on ECHO to really look at RV versus LV, because obviously with an RV infarct, you'd be trying to increase his preload. You'd be trying to increase his fluids to support his blood pressure. And then in this era, early, early time to cath lab with, with, with shock support if needed, and they'll look at the coronaries. So assessing clinically as, as well as the ECG, I guess. So for the purpose of ECG, I think uh, the 12 lead uh, precordial, uh, lead V1 may give a clue if it's horizontal versus uh, widely depressed in V2 or elevated. There's like an RV2 lead or just go ahead and do a right-sided ECG run. Uh, if you are trying to look for RV infarction, if there's RV infarction, then there's a RCA as a culprit. Uh, anything else to add for anyone else? Well, uh, just uh, to point out that, uh, yes, Uichim, it is uh, truly, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, it's dynamic. But the classical, of course, the classical changes in RV infarct is that you see ST elevation, isn't it? So you don't really see this. Uh, but that's ST depression, and uh, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, one is uh, it's it's really dynamic, and you can only say for sure uh, subsequent with subsequent ECGs. I, I guess practicality point of view, you either done a very quick echo, or I mean, in the old days before we had this sort of rapid to cath lab, we would do right sided chest leads V three V four R, 
V7, 8, 9, 10, the look at posterior infarction, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, that's, but that's an ECG kind of thing. But here, no, normally echo, and then you're rushing to the cath lab, probably, these days. Yeah, we're just instant gratification. Just go to cath lab and find out which artery. But the uh, which team is going to tell us that that may not be the right thing to do. Yeah, I'm so happy you mentioned about right-sided chest leads because that's what we did. And so let's see who can re read the right-sided chest leads. So we're going to go to Nasru. V4 so RV, V5 RV, V6 Is there RV infarct or not? Well, I think that I think there is. There's uh, subtle S elevation in uh, the uh, right side <laughs> leads, V5, V6. Yeah, so I think I think most likely the culprit is probably the right looking at this. So not LAD anymore. Has no. anybody here heard of an LED causing an RV infarct? Uh, no, it's anomalous, and then it goes around the other way. It supplies everything. Christmas trees. 25 yeah, single years coronary of coronary artery. Single coronary artery uh, for the whole heart, then migrating down to the right side. Yeah, malignant um, course and single course. Uh, everything's ischemic at one time there. Yep. But again, we are going fantastic diagnosis, so let's not move too far away. So uh, which him, please. So we brought the patients to uh, what well, we actually give thrombolytic therapy. And uh, this is how the ECG looks like after thrombolytic therapy. The patient was not in shock or oh, while well, he was not breathless. Remember he came in with chest pain, you know, pulmonary embolism symptom is predominantly dyspnea rather than chest pain. You know? So he's got this ECG after thrombolytic therapy. So maybe I ask uh, uh, Nasru again. Is this, does this qualify as a successful uh, thrombolysis based on ECG? Uh, well, the, well, I would say um, no. Um, he still has uh, some subtle ST elevation now at V2, um, some ST depression in uh, the inferior leads. Um, and there's still a bit of ST elevation in EVL. Um, well, I don't think this uh, would qualify as a resolution of uh, uh, MI, I would say, yeah. So I, I think classically, we tell the fellows that we based it on a few criteria. One is resolution of ST elevation, resolution of chest pain, and potentially some ventricular rhythm that you can see. So I would think that this looks pretty good, actually. Um, Sydney? In, in clinical trials, we define reperfusion as 50% uh, 50 50 or more of uh, the SC segment elevation being resolved. So if you look at the first ECG when it's anterior looking, then this would qualify as isoelectric. So that would be near 100% resolution of the SC segments anteriorly. If you look at the posterior infarct, the subsequent one, and well, it's SC depressed. And so if you reverse this reciprocal, the posterior is, is SC segment elevated. And this is also then V1 to V3 is isoelectric. So essentially, you would probably say this is ECG evidence of clinical reperfusion. Uh, good one in, at that, more than 50%. And so uh, near to 100%. Um, and so as you, as you mentioned before, the only other biochemical one, so resolution of chest pain, reperfusion VT, uh, the other one is, is a sort of a... Uh, uh, rapid uh, troponin or biomarker elevation and washout. But that's a time-dependent thing. It takes many hours to get a washout, a series of blood tests. Thanks, Sydney. The washout is more obvious post-PCI compared to thrombolysis, I think. Um, maybe we move on, Richard? The patient is pain-free. So obviously, the next thing is we want to define the anatomy and the culprit vessel, right? Uh, so, so this is what we do. We do an angiogram, the following day, in those days, uh, uh, thrombolytic era. <clears throat> this is the angiogram. So uh, patient has got a significant right coronary artery stenosis right here, which is uh, fully reperfused. Left coronary is normal. And that uh, this is a stent uh, result after PCI. So we were dealing with a RCA infarct here. So the question here is, why was the SD segment elevated in V1, V2, and, and the anthroceptosis? Actually, this is uh, quite a common thing, you know, because uh, ST segment elevation to uh, V1, V2 from RV infarction is something that has been recognized before. V1 
We know that RV infarctions uh, usually occur transiently. Uh, the ECG usually accompany uh, transiently, most resolve within 10 hours. And B4R, one millimeter ST segment elevation is probably the most predictive uh, ECG changes for RV infarct. But RV infarct can actually present with ST elevations in B1 and B2. And this actually was described by Mayers a long time ago, 1949, maybe 1950. So the characteristic ECG precordial ST elevation in an RV infarct is one where you actually have a progressive reduction in amplitude of ST elevations from B2 to B5. So the ST comes down as you go further out into the anterior release. You have progressive regression of the ST segment changes without the appearance of Q wave. So these patients did not have Q wave in the anterior septal release because if it's an LAD, it would have been the Q waves out finally. The reciprocal ST segment depression in lead one and VL were more marked in the latter because of the concurrent inferior MI. And the morphology of the elevator ST in the RV infarct is actually non-specific. So you can look like tombstone or you can look by any other morphology here. So this patient actually has a very dynamic sort of electrical myocardial injury current that is going around here. And this has been reported, uh, enthroceptor V1, V2, ST segments with RV infarction. So that's it. Thanks, Richim. Again, you showed me something I have not seen before. So I've learned something again, uh, Sydney and Rosley. Very nice. I think that's very, and very important too, because uh, proximal RCA occlusion, RV infarction, very nasty. Also, such a very high mortality rate. Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, something to minus and uh, I mean, it's, it's probably not wrong to consider that uh, there's an LED infarction, but uh, uh, once you get, you, once you see all the progression of uh, the ECGs and how he, he has to actually progress, then uh, the diagnosis of RV infarct is now more, uh, is, uh, is clearer than uh, when, you first, when you first see a patient with the, uh, the first ECG. But very nice. So this has been reported. Here's uh, our usual practice. <clears throat> Should I go on to the real entree here? Yeah, let's go to the entree then. The teaser is over. So that was not the one. <laughs> Appetizer. Or the 67-year-old guy uh, with a weight loss over the last four months and came in with acute chest pain. This is an ECG. Hmm. Sorry, Patrick, um, have you go first again? I can't see the ECG at the moment. Oh, there we go. Um, the story is concerning. Uh, I know the weight loss is, I assume, unintentional. So you think about constitutional symptoms. In regards to the chest pain and analysis of the ECG, it's got uh, hyperdynamic T waves anterior laterally. There's an absence of other uh, SC depression or reciprocal changes. This can be considered a STEMI equivalent. I would, however, clinically assess him for chest pain, ask for a repeat ECG in 10 minutes to determine um, evolution of these changes. But my suspicion is this is a STEMI equivalent. Um, Nasru, what test will you do again? If you're at the bedside, you are muted, sorry. Nasru, you are muted. Sorry, Nasru, you're, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, I would probably do a, a, a cardiac exam as well, troponin levels to see whether there's any uh, signs of uh, MI. Uh, although you, even if it's, uh, if it's, yeah. So, Wichim preempted you. The, the troponin yeah. is quite markedly raised. Yeah. Um, how, is there any other test besides uh, troponin? Um, I'll probably do a bedside echo as well. Okay. Yeah. So you're looking for? Um, to look to see whether there's any regional wall motion abnormalities, look to, to see whether there's any depressed in ejection traction. Okay. Which him, I think the fellow's thing is an uh, anterior hyperacute STEMI. Mm. Um, although if it's so hyperacute, I'm surprised the uh, enzymes are really so raised. Mm. But uh, well, what, what happened next? <laughs> so in modern times, you go to the cat flag, right? So this is a cap like picture. Okay, uh, Patrick. You got to see it? Yeah, we're seeing it. I don't currently see it. Describe the cap. Yep. 
Okay, uh, this is a radial angiogram. There's a, I can't see. Sorry, it's not playing for me at the moment. Sorry, you, you can't see, well, this is still picture. Thank you. Maybe Nasru, can you see? Uh, you can unmute yourself and comment as well. It's well, a, so, um, it looks like this gentleman has got a proximal, uh, sorry, a proximal or still left circumflex uh, lesion. Uh, the LED looks, uh, the rest of the vessels look pretty normal to me. Yeah, so it's probably thrombus. Yeah? It's probably a ruptured plug, a dissection. Yeah, can't tell from from this. Any other comments from uh, my professors here? Is it congruous with the ECG? Rosly, your, your comments? Uh, if you were to go back, you see, I mean, the only thing is that, number one, it is a large uh, circumflex. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's a, that makes the possibility that right is uh, it's either non-dominant or co-dominant. Uh, what is interesting is that you can see also bradycardia in this case. And um, uh, otherwise, other than a T, which is tall, it's very difficult to say uh, if it's, uh, you know, I, I couldn't really say that it's coming from any particular, um, uh, you know, vessel. So it's interesting to know that it's a, it's a, it's a osteal uh, circumflex here. Sydney, any comments from you? Yeah, just the ECG. I mean, there, it's besides the peak T waves, there's not a lot to hang your head on, except there's reduction in the uh, R wave height as you go to V5, V6. So the progression isn't so normal. And uh, there's loss of R wave height in one in AVL. And um, that's what I noticed before, but it's not a lot to ha hang on. If they were having chest pain, it looks like having an infarct with a positive troponin, then it looks like a blocked artery or a coronary event uh, of some sort. Um, totally agree, because in my session. But yeah, not a lot of hyperacuteness of ST segments anyway uh, in the CCG, but there's definitely something laterally. But. So my, my, my point for this uh, ECG is that the ECG is probably not so re relevant just to bear in mind that there are some areas on the ECG that's always silent, even if the vessel is occluded. For example, some of the acute marginals as well as diagonals. So I think the symptomatology, the chest pain assessment is quite important. And uh, you can send the patient a patient care flag even if the ECG is normal because sometimes they can have a large diagonal OM that's occluded yet ECG looks absolutely normal. Um, Huichin, would you like to show us more? Yeah, remember this uh, artery actually reperfused, you know, so by the time your patients come in, uh, there could be already some kind of resolutions. But anyhow, this is an osteo circumflex. Operator decides to go and balloon it, and then to follow by a stent of 4 -0 by 15 millimeter stent. And then we post dilate to a 5 -0 because the vessel looks really large. So that was the final results. Looks pretty reasonable, would you say? Just that uh, yeah. it looks like the stand is actually in the distal left main with some uh, uh, coronal shift, maybe in the osteo LED. Maybe. Or <clears throat> yeah. or... Maybe a thrombus in the distal part of the stand as well. Yeah. yeah. But the timing flow looks better. Yeah. yeah. This is a huge artery, you remember. So thrombus burden is probably going to be heavy here. So the iris uh, actually shows uh, pretty well a post stand here. Okay, so uh, so the patient was actually given uh, intracoronary epifibotype, which is what we commonly do, uh, and then followed by a heparin infusion because of the thrombus, because of the haziness that uh, Signy pointed out at the distal edge of the stand. So he decided maybe we should give some uh, to be three plus uh, anticoagulant as well. But certainly the stain looks uh, fairly well uh, opposed and uh, well expanded here with a 5-0 millimeter uh, non-compliant balloon. We can't see this uh, uh, thrombus very well on IVS. So before you, was, yeah. Sorry, before you move on, uh, uh, Huichim, can I just ask the practice from uh, Sydney? Uh, do you usually combine 2 b with intravenous heparin infusions at the moment? Uh, we uh, we do use a little bit of IV torafiban. Uh, uh, Rio Pro is off the market here, and we use we don't use epipetide very much at all. 
Uh, I think the Tara Fireband is what we use. And do we use it? And I think in uh, plate and naive people, we're worried about. Uh, so we use about 10% of people, even in STEMI. The use is very low now. And we would combine with heparin for about a day, one to three days, if we were concerned about thrombus. Yeah. Uh, Rosli, is that your... Practice? Yeah, on our side, we do have, uh, we only have pyrofibane at this, point, at this point in time. So in cases like this, if uh, I feel that uh, there's a high risk uh, of thrombus and I'm not really very sure, I would have uh, also put uh, given a bolus and uh, infusion of pyrofibane for at least uh, 24 hours. Um, and... Uh, and probably at the same time, if I were to add, uh, it's not going to be a heparin infusion. I tend to give uh, low molecular weight uh, heparin. So I want okay. to point out, because it's a fellow's course, that uh, these pharmacological things are not a substitute for uh, suboptimal stenting. If the stenting is really bad, this is not going to stop it from clotting up. Yeah, I think the points which in did show that the stent is very well expanded or pulsed, and there is a clot that he wants to resolve. Yeah, in the acute setting. Uh, wish him, please. So he was well and uh, sent back to CC, but, uh, developed chest pain again one hour later, and this is the ECG taken. So um, Nasru, maybe you can comment first. Mm. You're muted, sorry Nasru, you have to uh, try to- He's in, he's in sinus rhythm. Um, there's deep ST depression over at uh, V2 to V3, V4. Um, Possibly, um, I think because it looks like it's a dominant circumflex, um, probably the, the stent has been occluded. I would probably consider bringing this patient in back for, a, for an angiogram again. Uh, Patrick, will you agree? You would bring the patient back for angiogram? Yeah, I think uh, he's got posterior depression. He's got the hyperdynamic T waves but this is actually a worse ECG than when he first went in. And with the recurrence of chest pain, it's concerning. You would be interested to see what your immediate post PCI ECG was and compare it to this one one hour later. And if there was dynamic changes, you'd be concerned to take him back. So are you concerned about now the circumflex or the LED based on this ECG? Uh, this is difficult. I think it's posterior. Um, so you, you would be first concerned about the circ. However, we did talk about the circumflex osteo. So Sydney, um, is, is there anything possibly else encroaching? Error? You could have known if you put a wide LED and ibis. If you ibis down the LED, you would have known if there was encroachment of your circ stent. Um, of course, the final flow was Timmy three in both vessels, but both are a consideration. Okay. I, I think that's fine. I think probably because you put a stent in and stents are still thrombogenic material and you had thrombus, the main concern is your circumflex stent, obviously. There was, as you mentioned on the angiogram, a little bit of carina shifting and maybe a stent in the left main, but uh, but obviously that's, a, that's, that's DD number two. But I think on this, you'd be most concerned about circumflex stent. Okay, we yeah, can... I, I think what is impo also important is, 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 is here you have, you have treated a patient and patients well, and uh, the patient again complained of chest pain, and you have this uh, new ECG changes. So I believe whatever it is, this is a case that uh, should warrant a repeat angiogram. Uh, and uh, you know because you're you're concerned in the first place with this patient, you did an IVUS, you were giving aptifib diet, and obviously you are concerned that uh, you know the the, uh, the fact that you treated it with something extra suggests that uh, this is not the normal routine uh, PCI for uh, STEMI that you are dealing with. So I would, I would definitely bring the patient back in. Okay, so we're going back to the care flag then, Richie. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's go back to the care flag. Well, what's that? So, uh, Patrick, you want to comment on the care findings? Can you see the run? Yes, I can. The circumflex is certainly abnormal. There's a it seems to be some diffuse tissue prolapse through the entire length of the circumflex stent. The distal flow is not as good as it previously was. And then if we look distal to the stent, the entire so mid vessel, a strange roachman. So the circumflex stent 
uh, I would be rewiring and irising. I suspect a significant amount of, of tissue prolapse in there uh, with poor flow as well as distal to the circumflex stent. Uh, there's luminal irregular. So Nasru, will you do anything different or what, what is your suspicion about what is happening? Uh, so Patrick says uh, I, tissue prolapse. Yeah, I think we should consider the presence of thrombus as well because uh, uh, the final shot, I, I mean, we, we did see there was probably some evidence of thrombus at, at the distal stent. So I think I would be uh, con concerned about the presence of thrombus. I think I would go in with a wire, Ivers and possible suctioning uh, if required, yeah. So now, Rosalie, maybe... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering guess, whether this... I'm just wondering whether there was a, uh, an edge, distal stem edge vasection uh, that may have actually uh, led on to all this. Uh, Sydney? Yeah, well, I would agree with I would agree with Rosley, and I think the caliber of the vessel, you know, it's a big vessel, and you had a big balloon, and um, I think that I'm con concerned it might be a distal edge dissection, and um, and I think there's now reduced flow and maybe vasospasm in the circumflex as much as much as there's a bit of clot in the stent itself. I would tend to think that uh, I think sometimes it may be difficult, even if you had an IVERS because of the thrombus there to obscure the edge dissection that might have progressed downwards. It, it looks very hazy and it doesn't look like just pure clots. It looks like there's probably a tear that progressed and the timmy flow has now come down to maybe just two. So uh, Huichim, well, what happened next? So operator tried to uh, well, we diagnose a uh, thrombus here. So uh, did some aspirations followed by ballooning and so a number of balloons was done. Actually patients became very sick became hypotensive, became bradycardic, and uh, requires atrophy and adrenaline and dopamine infusion. But anyhow, managed to stabilize him, and this was the uh, final result of the uh, second care. Still a little bit hazy here, but uh, certainly tachycardic from all the drugs that's been given. But team was Ivers for... used the second time, Eugene? Oh. Yes. Uh... Not Ivers this time round because Ivers was already done before and there was no dissection and it was well expanded and the post there was no uh, there was no repeat Ivers here. Now, like you say, when you have so much thrombus, you really can't see what's going on. So, uh, Rossi, you think this is consistent? The hypertension and dinotropic requirement from this? Um, um, I expected from because this is as uh, uh, Jim said, it's very sick. It's a large vessel. Um, obviously, if you have a very uh, severe flow uh, disruption, then you may actually get a hemodynamic disturbance. Um, I'm just a bit not happy with uh, that. The, the flow is now good. I'm just concerned that, uh, you know, if we have not really treated uh, the issue, um, then so because this is hazy at the point where distilled to the stent, about two, five mm distilled to the stent. So, I'm very hesitant because uh, if you don't really uh, treat the underlying cause, uh, the patient might come back again and have uh, repeated problems. So yeah, I would I'll agree with uh, Rosie, and I think probably I would I would uh, do imaging again because I need to really understand what's going on here. Obviously, possible to do OCT, but you have to flush contrast in or saline even to try to, and it might propagate things. But if you don't think it's a dissection here, you're prepared to leave it. OCT might give you a better look. But obviously, even in the still frame, there's thrombus at the ostium of the LAD, thrombus at the ostium of the circumflex. And I think that probably I would need to image it to be really clear what I'm leaving him with uh, after all the problem, he was so sick with it. Yeah, so which I think it looks like all the senior folks here is uncomfortable about this finishing result, particularly at the stand age, uh, distal stand age, it looks hazy throughout. Uh, there's still some grottiness somewhere that wasn't visible before. So uh, we're fearful that this will happen again, uh, uh, What so happened Any change next? in your drugs? Would you do anything? Remember you was- uh, I, I'm, I'm also worried when you have this sort of osteal circumflex in a large territory, I'm worried about things like ischemic mitral regurgitation. He was pretty sick. So sometimes I might even echo him on the table uh, to see that he doesn't have any valvular stuff, particularly if it's hypotensive or remains hypotensive, uh, because you want to miss anything else that's going to have you happening during this. Hmm. 
But the well, anti coagulation so, is what Pichim was asking about. Uh, yeah. Anything else uh, you would do? Any add ons, uh, Rosley? Oh, he has been given what? Uh, aspirin plus ticagrolol, right? Yeah. And aptifibitide. Yeah. Um, aspirin infusion also. Hmm. I. Don't really, you know, you know, in the past, uh, you know, when uh, we're concerned, we did give some uh, intracoronary lytic therapy, but uh, in this case, um, and I, but I've stopped using that for a long, long time. We don't really have uh, intra uh, coronary lytic therapy anymore, so it's not a practice I do uh, nowadays. So the other consideration is really, uh, you know, like in in LED infarcts particularly, but here is just the circumflex, but things like a intraaortic balloon pump. Um, which might, because sometimes the cardiac output perfusion, you want to support that a little bit because uh, the thing we do now is just do a blood gas and look at the lactate, see if things have changed. Mm -hmm. If people are actually slowly getting incipient shock um, in these sort of case scenarios during infarcts. But it, there's a consideration for support. And once again, we run IV tyro fiber and heparin uh, and, and check, the, check all those things, ABTT. I personally feel that I, when I saw the LV contracting, it doesn't, it looks fairly hyperdynamic with inotropes. I would actually consider even putting in a swan to check the volume status before escalating hemodynamic support. But uh, we should let's see what your team did. So uh, I think uh, managed to achieve flow and uh, so basically give uh, more boli of uh, intracoronary aptifibotide and this time followed by uh, aptifibotide uh, maintenance infusion. And uh, while he actually remains fairly stable after that, that intraoperative uh, episodes of hypotension, but after which uh, he was uh, sufficiently stabilized. And this was the, uh, the treatment plan. So we brought him uh, to a CCO, this is an echo. Not too bad, actually. LV function, I think is about 40% here. Even the lateral wall seems to be contracting still. So, he, he didn't really have a big time uh, infarction here. The intervention has always been good. So we decided to bring him back uh, four days later in the hospital while he's still hospitalized. And this was the uh, picture. Uh, during comments, which time uh, he has remained pain-free. So uh, Patrick, are you happier now with this angiogram? The flow is certainly better. The proximal circumflex almost looks aneurysmal near the segment of the stent. Um, mismatched to the rest of the size of the vessel. Certainly the thrombus burden has dissipated, clearly responded well to the intravascular therapies. Um, I'd be tempted to leave it despite the aneurysmal look. So I, yes, I am happy. Okay, uh, are, are the other guys happy? Uh, Sydney and Rosley? Look, look uh, still looks a bit hazy in the stand, but of course it's uh, got some flow, a little bit less than Timmy 3. The caliber is not as big as we see before. You, you're always concerned when not you've done something like a contained rupture and you had this aggressive post dilatation with a 5.0 in that. Of course, you'd be tempted and you debate the pros and cons of doing, once again, a repeat IVUS. But yeah, maybe maybe we see repeat IVUS or some imaging of this. So, uh, so Wichim, what do you think is the cost for the, uh, you know, for the thrombus uh, formation the second time around? You I tell you what the operator was thinking. Yes. <laughs> so he thinks that there's still some residual thrombi, uh, particularly in the uh, circ as well as the LED. Uh, some imaging and perhaps some intervention may be necessary. So shall I go on? Yes. So this was an uh, imaging done of the circumflex. It's quite actually still some thrombus you can see, and actually a mix of both red as well as white thrombi. Mm. But the stain is really quite well opposed here. I don't see any more opposition. So. But certainly you can see thrombus here. Yeah. So then he decided that uh, we're going to do a kissing balloon of the circ and the uh, LED just to make sure that the uh, thrombus are all cleared up. And, uh, and then the patient was discharged actually with a combination therapy of clopidogrel and warfarin because of this the tumoric uh, tendency here. Mm. So far so good? Do you agree? Yeah, but, but I think that what was useful with the OCT was to 
demonstrate that there was really no distal edge uh, issue. The stem was very well opposed. You could also define that those loggy stuff you saw was truly uh, just looks like clots. So you then can administer the appropriate therapy, I think. That was very good. Um, any comments on Rosley? Also, the fact that uh, there is no um, um, malform uh, not malformation, malposition, I think is very important. Though I feel that uh, usually when I see this uh, thrombus and uh, but the flu is already is already good and it's been about four days, I would tend to leave it alone because uh, it's not flu limiting and uh, thrombus will then uh, uh, resolve over over time. So I would not, usually I wouldn't want to cause any more problems or you know by causing any pressure injury by doing a, a, a balloon angioplasty. I would have actually left it alone and uh, probably uh, continue the anticoagulation a bit longer. And, uh, and just to do lenticular therapy uh, on board at the same time. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for an angioplasty and uh, you know, just to clear off the thrombus based on uh, OCT. Do you agree with Rosley? I wouldn't have dilated. I wouldn't have dilated. And uh, uh, I, I, OCT is very reassuring. I don't know that I would have given him warfarin. I think I would have just uh, had to do any platelets. We almost use... Uh, aspirin and tacagula. So once again, probably similar to Rosalie, a few more days of IV heparin in hospital, and then uh, maybe a couple more days, and then I, I would just send him on to any platelets out, usually tacagula and aspirin. I would probably tend to agree with Sydney. I think the evidence still favors just a DAPT in this case, but I, I don't think it's wrong to give uh, uh, copidogrel and uh, warfarin if you really want to. Might have even considered NOAC maybe, uh, which him, your comments? I would have given NOAT uh, if I want to use anticoagulant, but usually anticoagulant in this setting, I'm not sure. I think still a dual antipolated therapy is the deal here. <clears throat> Anyhow, I want to take you to the next part of the story because the story is not over yet. <clears throat> so he come back uh, two months later, chest pain again. And this is the ECG. And this is a trending of the troponin. So uh, Patrick, you're back, right? So maybe you can comment again um, on this yep. ECG. He's, uh, ECG is read in the analysis of a troponin showing a significant delta. So he's had a non-STEMI or a strain. The ECG sinus, there's again, hyperdynamic T waves or de winter T waves interiorly. He's got an incomplete right bundle branch block and there is some ST elevation in B1. Um, in terms of change, other reciprocal changes, not really there, maybe some subtle ones in V5, V6, uh, V4 actually. So overall concerning, you'd worry maybe there's now LAD involvement given the lateral lead changes and septal ST elevation. So second time round, you bring this case to the care flag again with this enzyme rise? Yeah, I'd take him to the lab. Okay, so we should- so Fourth time he's going to the lab, you know? <clears throat> <laughs> what do you think is the, the culprit then? Any guess? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Nasru? I think it probably could be the left anterior descending artery, I think, because there was some plug, plug prolapse, um, some he haziness at the proximal LED, I think, during the second angiogram. So I think it could be the LED that's involved. So your uh, Nasru is speculating this peak T waves could be LED. Um, Sydney and Rossi put you on the spot. Your guess. Well, I, I, it looks as if it's like you were back to the same ECG, the first ECG, it looks as if. Uh, then I'm, I would uh, think that it's uh, the circumflex that is causing the same uh, issue. Yeah, we, we've done the most work in a circumflex, so it's got to be number one. Number two, yes, potentially LAD, but uh, we've dilated. But uh, you got to put your money on the circumflex, I imagine. Yeah, I think uh, for me, if it's truly LAD, I would like to see a lot more respiratory changes in fear lead. So my money is also on the circ. But Huichi may show me something else. Huichi? So we go back again. This is the angiogram. The INR was 1.78. So a little bit low though. A bit of haziness still uh, in the ostium of the LAD. But the circ itself looks so right, largely. And we do another imaging again. The stent is still well, well opposed. But there's still some thrombus going on, you know. So the thrombus never quite go away completely. <clears throat> so
So what's going on here? This is a, somebody with a recurrent uh, stain thrombosis. Uh, uh, we don't see any mechanical cause to it. And uh, just thinking, uh, what else would you like to do? So the regime is grill and morphine, is that correct? For now, moment? yeah, yeah. And do we manage to check for grill resistance here? Uh, no. Okay. Um, maybe not, not so fair to put the fellows on the spot. I'll ask uh, Rosley again. Rosley. Sorry, what, 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 what's your question again? Yeah, what was what, what else we do? Uh, Ver verify now. Verify now. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we we don't have that anyway. Uh, but uh, you know, the the stent thrombosis doesn't seem to be um, uh, causing in uh, fluid problem issues. Uh, but uh, you you really see that after two months, uh, I would actually put him on uh, uh, take a grill or rather and take off the. Uh, uh, clopidogrel and give it a bit uh, over a longer period of time, at least for 12 months. Hmm. Do you so, think these so, patients warrant any further workout? Um, I, well, um, I suppose uh, one, if uh, you are really concerned, then you can do all the normal workout, but uh, it's a bit unusual to, to, uh, to get just uh, the right coronary artery being, I mean, the, the coronary artery is being involved without involving other uh, arteries. But if uh, one is to be complete, then uh, one what I uh, would like to try to do and uh, I woke up to see whether there's increased risk of thrombosis in this particular person. Sydney? So, so I, 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 look, number one is that previously, uh, uh, all the data doesn't suggest that Verify now helps that much. So we generically use a, a stronger P two Y twelve CPTP so to carry glow. But in the old days, Prezigrel you might change from one to the other. So if you're on Capitagrel, you had to go to Prezigrel to carry And these days, if you like that, you go to the carry And like in Plato, it it kind of takes out all your wild type genetic mutations, covers it. In terms of other workup. I guess you're suggesting potentially thrombophilias or vasculitis, and you do some some blood tests. And it's not unreasonable to, if you think that a inflammatory vasculitis is increasing your thrombogenic risk, um, and you can send off some blood tests to look at that, ANAs, etc., extracellular nuclear antigens, etc., um, and you can do a thrombophilia screen while you're at it. Although it's not an embolic thing. So my, my thoughts are that you have a 5-0 stand that have a recurrent ischemic event with TROP. But so I think it's very reasonable to do further tests to assess for whether it's a antithrombin tree or what, what not autoimmune. But you have to bear in mind that while warfarin all these tests are not very accurate, I, I would still do a plated function test, a classic one not verified now, um, and just get a hint of whether there's copidogrel resistance contributing to this, and I'll just switch to aspirin ticagalor uh, for long-term therapy. Plus, not too sure whether I want to have a very low dose, real rock span 2.5 BD kind of regime here then for a second episode of uh, uh, clots. Uh, Huichin, let's see what your team did. Let me run you a little bit of uh, a battery of blood tests here. So the blood test, we will defer to the fellows. Uh, so we'll start with Patrick first. The Your highlighted comment. ones are the abnormal one. Um, I just recall his two months of unintentional weight loss at the start. And so again, you're worried about constitutional symptoms. You're worried about a tumor, whether that's be prothrombotic from a vascular process or cancer. In the blood investigations, his full blood count is abnormal for thrombocytopenia. Moderate platelets are above 50, but their 76 are quite low. He's got an eosinophilia double. Um, again, that's more a vasculitic para parasitic infection can also cause it, but you're more thinking a, a, a vasculitis. Um, the eosinophil count in the, in the smear is very high, 15%. In terms of his lipid profile, his LDL is very well controlled, less than 1.8. You would still try and aim for very high statins because it's a very reactive endothelium on that OCT and that uh, Inflammatory mediating benefits of statins would go a long way as well. His creatinine is stable, so his kidneys. In regards to his rest of his workup, his lupus screen is negative. So his double-stranded DNA, anti-cardiolipin, anti-B12, IgG, IgM, and double-stranded DNA are all negative. Complement CN3, mild reduction in C3, preservation of C4. 
and a Serum IgG 36. Not sure what to make of that. I think it's pretty non-specific. The things that are outstanding is the peripheral eosinophilia with thrombocytopenia. So I'm more thinking of vasculitis, um, IgG mediated. Um, I think the, the, the C3 complement is a little bit non-specific. So based on this, uh, Nasrul, do you have a guess at the diagnosis? Um, well, the only vasculitis that I can think of that would cause eosinophilia would be Chuck. Chickstrom syndrome, I think. Um, that's the only one that I would think of. I um, can't think of any vasculitis that would cause a very high use in a field town, actually, besides that. But that's a good talk. Um, Sydney or Rosley? Your guess before? I'm just yes. waiting for Wei to tell us. <laughs> so, no, the, the <laughs> IG, I I, so he's got a monoclonal gammopathy, so IgG is up, and uh, he's complement activated. And uh, eosinophils with and a plate counts low, so it's um, some sort of vasculitis. Has he got a history of asthma? Shirk Strauss? He's got a rash. Um, Shirk Strauss vasculitis. <laughs> He's got a weight loss. That was a clue right from the beginning. Yeah. So um, I, I, I think. Yeah. Please go on. I I would agree. Some form of. Uh, even though uh, disease state vasculitis would be a good guess. But any test you want to do? Um, anchor, anchor, and uh, extract all your tangents. Anchor would be good. Hmm. So we did. Uh, there's a IgG uh, elevation. So we typically also do a uh, subclass analysis. IgG four is elevated. I, I, I truly don't know what to make of this. Uh, anyone else has comments? Uh, not, not so good. <laughs> 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 not, not much to comment. <laughs> we can't okay. tell you. Okay. So we're, we're waiting for Huichin to teach us here then. So we went to do a CT scan, uh, thorax of the abdomen for this patient's complaint of loss of weight as well. And we could see some soft tissue masses uh, encasing the bilateral renal pelvises. This is a radio lucent uh, opacity right here. And we also did a uh, MRI of the uh, head because we were thinking of that diagnosis already. So you can see that there's actually, uh, the, the report was that there was enlarged bilateral lacrima, parotid and submandibular glands, orbital mastitis, retropubal inflammatory uh, changes as well. So this looks like a uh, very swollen optic nerve here compared to the left side. <clears throat> the final diagnosis here is uh, based on all this uh, changes, blood tests and imaging is that this patient actually has got IgG4 related disease with recurrent stent thrombosis. So that IgG4 is very important actually. <clears throat> so just in case you haven't heard of IgG4 related disease, uh, this is actually, actually an immune mediated condition, which is associated with insidious multi-organ fibrosis and inflammation uh, it's probably uh, important, uh, T-cell is probably important in this uh, immune-mediated uh, process. It actually co comprises collection of disorders that share specific clinical serology, radiology, and pathologic features, most common in middle age and older, older men. So this is a common, the commonest uh, sort of autoimmune disease that affects men, uh, often present with subacute development of a mass in the affected organs or diffuse enlargement of organs. So the, cut, the hallmarks of IgG4 related disease is histology. Firstly, you have an elevated serum level of IgG4. And when you take a tissue sample, you will see this lymphoplasmacytic tissue inflations. And you were to stain it, it's all IgG4 positive plasma cells and accompanied by fibrosis. And the fibrosis has got this very characteristic, characteristic story form. You know, it's got this uh, cut wheel sort of a pattern here. Uh, appearance of this arranged fibroblast and inflammatory cells. So this is a very classical picture of IgG4 pattern. And so what is the clinical phenotypes here? Our patients can present with a pancreatal hepatobiliary disease, retroperitoneal fibrosis, head and neck disease, Mikulic syndrome, which include uh, sclerosing cell adenitis, inflammatory orbital pseudotumor, which we have in these patients, and chronic sclerosing uh, dacryloadenitis. Sometimes they can also have uh, pneumonitis and pulmonary inflammatory changes as well. But for cardiologists, what are the cardiac involvement in the IgG4-related disease? 
vasculitis, as, uh, as you all mentioned, can, uh, including periarthritis, uh, which may present as sudden death, coronary artery aneurysm presenting as ACS, inflammatory periaortitis, pericardial effusion, cardiac pseudotumor. So I have two patients in my whole career right now of IgG4 related disease. The first one is actually a recurrent or hemorrhagic pericardial effusion. So when you look at the patients that echo, uh, sometimes you can see mass inside this. So this patient has got a mass, okay, in this, uh, in this atrium. And interestingly, sometimes you can see mass on a CT scan encasing a coronary artery as well. So this patient has got a right atrial mass as well as a mass encircling the, the coronary artery. <clears throat> so our patient has got elevated serum IgG4, hypocomplementemia, characteristic involvement of the salivary glands, orbits and kidneys, recurrent stent thrombosis, presumably from an arthritis. So the treatment here is uh, you need to bring down the inflammatory process. So start out with glucocorticoids, so spritnisolone, and followed by uh, steroid sparing agents if necessary, which can include biologic agents such as monoclonal antibodies or immunosuppressants. So our patient was pulsed with intravenous methylprednisolone, followed by a tapering regime of oral prednisolone, and after which he's been asymptomatic uh, on the dual antiplatelet therapy for the last two years of follow-up. His serum IgG4 becomes normal, and the CT scan actually show a uh, dramatic reduction in the size of the intra-abdominal mass, but he declined uh, a repeat uh, coronary angiography. And this is where I want to show you the CT scan. So this was in the beginning, and this is now complete resolutions of the mass of the IgG4 related disease. So <clears throat> just remember there's such thing as a IgG4 related disorder involving your heart. Beautiful entry. Yeah. Thanks, Richim, again. Beautiful uh, starting entry. I must say, very, very nice. Uh, Sofian from Brunei actually guessed it. Uh, she was spot on doing this IgG4. I've seen one other case in uh, my center as well. And it, like you rightly put, it's like this encasing thing around the coronary artery that resolves fully after you get the right diagnosis with this high dose steroid for a while is beautiful resolution. The, the trick is getting the diagnosis, I think. So thanks a lot, beautiful case. Any other comments from anyone? Uh, just just question, which, uh Do they present with one phenotype or can they have more than one phenotype uh, presentation? You can have a multi-organ uh, involvement. Oh, in yeah. Case, yeah. yeah. Right. Wow, good. So when Thank you see you. IgG elevated, next time do a subclass. Now I'm reminded, IgG for years. <laughs> Let's go to the second case. This is a 39-year-old Filipino domestic helper, no cardiovascular risk factor of note, came in with two weeks of central squeezing chest pain, which occurs both at rest and during exertion. So each episode lasting for about two to three minutes, and she also has loss of weight of kilo, four kilograms over the last three weeks. This was a presenting ECG. So we we'll start out with uh, Nasru first, uh, youngish female, chest pains. What do you make of the ECG? Well, she's in sinus rhythm. She's got um, uh, acid depressions over at the uh, anthroceptal leads, uh, as well as the lateral leads. Um, she has got voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, yeah, normal axis. What, what test would you like to do? Um, I would like to do an, uh, an echo, uh, firstly, uh, and I would probably like to do a cardiac enzyme, yeah. So cardiac enzyme, basic echo. Uh, Patrick, any guess at the diagnosis here? The intermittent nature of a pain lasting quite a short amount of time. You think about spasm uh, coming and going from a coronary perspective. As mentioned, the ECG is abnormal with LVH criteria, lots of ST depression, and also AVR, there's that concave ST elevation, which is quite concerning. Um, I, if she's pain-free at the bedside when I first meet her, I'm a little less worried, but if she's got active pain, I'd be doing an emergency echo and considering even taking her to the lab yeah, urgently. Comments she was from, symptomatic uh, here. Chest pain with this ECG, uh, comments from Sydney. What, what were you so, I mean, potentially left main ischemia and, uh, you know, this is, <laughs> could be sort of 
left main vasculitis or, or actually myocarditis, but essentially it's it's a left main look looking semia. So it's a worrying ECG. I would agree, you can have a quick echo, but probably we'll have to come to the lab um, unless they're 16 years old. Even then, we'll often shoot the coronaries um, to really clearly define the coronaries. Uh, Rosalie, we yeah. also the same. Um, and you know, in a young, especially lady. Uh, one would always uh, have your, uh, in the back of mind uh, whether the person can have uh, Takayashi's arthritis. And uh, I've seen uh, two young people and uh, one of them actually died suddenly. Uh, in fact, they died suddenly during the angiogram and uh, you know, with uh, left mean stem disease and when you engage and that's it. So I think I would like to consider a young lady like this with that. Are there any other uh, signs, uh, the peripheral pulses, were they equal? Or normal. Yeah, so so I, I do agree the ECG does, does look very threatening. In spite of the age, no risk factor, it does look like a left main equivalent ECG, so you do have to find that out. The LVA suggests to me you have to examine her properly, make sure you don't miss uh, maybe a bicuspid severe aortic stenosis at the same time with uh, LVH or some form of hokum that is possible as well. But again, threatening ECG, I agree with the echo, the enzyme, and the care flag. Uh, which in? So what would you do? Well, someone gave a GTN, right? It's after GTN. So after GTN, it looks like the ST segments all went away. So yes. I, I think Patrick was on to something um, about this uh, variant angina type symptoms. Uh, any other comments from uh, Sydney, maybe? So either all vessels are spasmodic or the left main, but maybe all sp vessels are spasmodic. So uh, it's a vasospastic thing and it's certainly responsive to GTN. The question in your mind is, but if your echo is normal, do you still go to the cath lab? <laughs> Probably so. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's the wood. Yeah, so I think Rosley and Sid will say cath lab because you can't be sure, right? <laughs> so which him, was that what happened? So this is the enzymes. There's some changes, isn't it? <clears throat> so the differential diagnosis at this point in time, I, I was just hearing quite, quite a number. Is this a AMI, ACS, or is this a spasm, or is this myocarditis, or Takosubo, or uh, autoimmune disorder? So uh, let's go to the cath lab and see. This is the angiogram. This is after uh, giving nitro and shooting or just shooting? No, just they shooting. This nitro. is after nitro. Spasm goes away. So what is your take here? We do the right. The right is also, uh, uh, there was some osteostenosis as well that uh, also resolved with GTN according to the operator. But uh, most of the arteries, uh, to me, it looks pretty normal to me. Do you agree? Yep. Yes, so, don't need a stent. No need stent, right? So, so this was a report. Uh, they think that it's some kind of a catheter-induced spasm. It's resolved with GTN. Uh, I, I'm not so sure that there's two minor irregularities going on. It looks pretty normal to me. So at this point in time, the echo shows that it was normal, the heart function. But we treat this just for coronary artery spasm, right? <clears throat> is that fair enough? So we gave, uh, well, initially it was given DAPT uh, followed by CCB because in coronary artery spasm, you really don't want to give beta blocker. Uh, lipid profile was okay. So she was discharged with uh, Diotazem 30, Atovastatin 40, and GTM PRN. Any comment? Any point? Are you agreeable or? Um, anyone? Um... Patrick, maybe you suggested spasm, you're right. Is this an appropriate therapy? I think it's appropriate therapy. I don't think it uh, explains her weight loss and that remains to be investigated. I'm not sure how it's a unifying diagnosis, but certainly on that first left catheter shot, the left main was very spasmodic, responded very well. Um, she's been lucky that she's had a very small trot rise. So a small non-STEMI and has preserved biventricular function, but if she's not compliant with this therapy and she has major spasm, she could have significant morbidity. So you'd be doing this medication reconciliation with a lot of counselling on the need for it. Um, 
specifically remaining compliant with her GTN and calcium channel blockers. But separately, we still need to investigate her weight loss. Patrick, I ask you because in Australia, what are the common causes of coronary artery spasm? Too much partying. Um, you can have money. illicit substances. Illicit substances induced, cocaine specifically, is a consideration. Um, it wasn't elicited in the history. Um, so what was there any history of uh, any other drug intake here? Uh, Explaining no. weight loss, maybe some weight loss pills and stuff like that? No. Not that we, we can find. Okay. So but uh, if tolerated, you probably should be on uh, like uh, some nitrates, right? It's just GTN was PRN, but I would if there's retreating spasm, then I think uh, regular dose of daily GTN, patch or oral. Okay. Well, oral is well, but not so good. So went home. <clears throat> Five days post-discharge, she had a cut out of hospital cardiac arrest. <clears throat> So, uh, so the story goes that she was, uh, in fact, she was completely well talking to the employer. And two minutes later, the employer turned her back on her and she was found lying on, bed, on her back. Unresponsive, uh, foaming from mouth, limb jerking, bystander CPR started, uh, civil defense force uh, activated, uh, given to one shock for a shockable rhythm. Uh, it was uh, ventricular fibrillations are recorded on the defibrillator and that uh, and successfully cardioverted. The dial time was about 10 minutes. And the story after that, the uh, patient says that she actually has continued chest pain, chest pain two days, occurring the day before and also on the day itself before she collapsed. What to do? Uh, Rosalie? Well, uh, I would actually like to bring you back in to, to see, have a look at the, uh, the, the angiogram and see whether there's any change to anatomy. Uh, though I think um, it's probably going to be that what I find, but uh, at least uh, to be on the safe side, I, I want to make sure. What, what, what were you, are you looking for, Rosalie, when you bring back to the care lab? Uh, I suppose, uh, you know, uh, uh, if it is, it's uh, to see whether there's any, you know, I, I know that there's no lesion, but uh, it, when, when I look even after the angiogram, I thought that the left mean stem was not the same size as when you combine both the LED and the, the circumflex together. It's, it's still like a tubular stenosis to me. So I just want to make sure that uh, there's nothing that uh, we've missed. Sydney? Uh, I was thinking, does she have a history of hypertension or palpitations? Maybe she's got a fear. Uh, no hypertension. Fear may uh, may come to us. She get really a catecholaminergic and uh, and having funny things and can drive yeah, that that can drive spasm. Mm. But no palpitation, no chest pain, no sweating, perspirations, and no hypertension. Um, any thoughts from the fellows? Anything else you like? Just just five days ago and brought in collapse. Uh, yeah, so apart from getting over the, apart from getting over the initial arrest, obviously it's going to be post arrest care, short downtime. She was lucky it was semi witnessed, so you don't anticipate a brain injury. So we've, we've got to think about long term how to manage this lady. Dr. Lowe mentioned, you know, long term GTN. She's on GTN PRN is one thing. So certainly a long acting isosorbide mononitrate would be a consideration. She's reported pain for two days, and that also is alarming because she's failed to escalate that so it's all about close follow-up with this lady whatever the management ends up being it's close monitoring ensuring compliance and let's escalate her nitrates i think she actually missed indication for icd as well uh, if you ask me but um, then again we do have to find out what is precipitating vessel spasm age 40 right it doesn't happen overnight so i uh, probably do all this other markers for vasculitis and find out whether there's any hormonal imbalance, check the thyroid function, uh, the usual works. Uh, Hui Ching? So let me just show you the physical findings at that time. So she was intubated, uh, but she was still uh, uh, drowsy, but able to open her eyes into, uh, transiently, uh, pushing the doctor's hands away. Uh, blood pressure was 233, 115, you know, with all this uh, uh, results going on. 
pupils was all right. There was no radio, radio pulse delay, heart lungs was clear, and this was an ECG at the time. But this is post results already. You know, she got shocked back into a normal rhythm. But it looks very normal again, post mm -hmm. uh, results. And, so you want to go to the cath lab? Yeah, Rosalie wants to go to the cath lab desperately. So we should Are show him. Are you anticipating him. anything new? I'm not anticipating anything new, actually, but I might be surprised. Left main spasm? Yeah, spasm everywhere, I would think, to cause this. But she's well already. I mean, yeah, after po post-arrest, you get lots of spasm, right? So that's the problem. The BP is okay. I mean, she's sky-high BP, but... And I don't think anyone is uh, going to quibble if uh, an angiogram is done, um, uh, a repeat angiogram is done, because... You know, you you you've seen the, the changes, and you you just have to know. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, if it happens again, and you'll be questioning yourself, uh, why didn't why didn't you do an angiogram just to make sure that you're right? Uh, sometimes uh, I think if you're really concerned, you might even do an imaging uh, during the angiogram to just to see if there's any lesions in the left knee. So if they were like uh, arguing like like she did originally and uh, then collapsed, then we have to make sure she didn't have subarachnoid hemorrhage. So often we scan people. Um, for that as well. We find a few several hemorrhages that's, that's caused the cardiac arrest. But in any case, um, you know, like Tomahawk, there's no ST elevation now. So you don't necessarily need to go in the next 10 minutes. You could be tomorrow. But uh, if you're still concerned, it's not unreasonable. So with that kind of BP response, I'll also be looking for more of the neuroendocrine tumors, maybe. So I'll scan her everywhere now. Yep. But uh, I, I don't think doing a cap is unreasonable. But Would you like do a provocative test if an angiogram shows normal coronary again? Yes, I, I'm worried I, about fear, so I would have take, like, taken a quick scan to see if there's adrenal gland mass or something. <laughs> no, I'm thinking whether you would do a, a spasm provocative test. You mean uh, acetylcholine I, challenge? Yeah, acetylcholine, agumatrin. Would anybody do it? We have, yeah. Uh, we used to do when well, I was a train a long, long time ago, Ogonovine, but we we uh, we we don't. And currently, we haven't done much the Casal Colin challenge. I was coming back in the fashion for Inoka. Yeah, I have no experience. Uh, perhaps Rosley, I I wouldn't because she clearly had a vasospastic mechanism. I'm not too sure whether Casal Colin will add on to that. So usually for ACH challenge, you need to wash out of all medications. So if you're a kidney resuscitated, you don't know what you've been given, you need to probably wait a day or two, usually two or three days. We usually wash out people three days of all meds. And of course, it, you know, it's about how you do it. So you're going to have to do all FFR and all three vessels and um, et cetera before you even uh, do all that. A complete study. So uh, we go to the cath lab again. Yeah, looks like it. Same finding. Anything else you want to do? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is try. the time we are talking about this acetylcholine challenge, right? Um, uh, so the echo, does the echo show good function? I mean, it's not tachycardia or anything. Uh, so the right is also normal. Troponin is 9,009. Echo is normal. Any thoughts, uh, Rosley? Well, from this, I think it just proves that uh, there's no obvious lesion that uh, one can see. And uh, you've seen that uh, spasm, and spasm in the past. Um, once again, um, uh, you know, did you do all the other scans uh, that were you know, suggested in the past just now? Sorry, what, what, what scans? S scans, just see if there's anything else, neuroendocrine uh, uh, tumors that can account for this, the blood pressure being very high. Uh, we did a CT scan of the head. Uh, there, there was no intracranial hemorrhage. That's what Sydney was saying. I would do a cardiac MRI. Okay. I uh, think that I, I certainly wouldn't give acetylcholine on the table. She's just had a cardiac arrest. As Dr. Lowe, from a diagnostic perspective, you need a washout period, but more from a, a patient's stability. She's just suffered a massive insult and has nearly died. I think we're happy with the, with the pictures and get her off the table and resuscitate, let her recover. 
But cardiac MRI would actually be quite uh, instructive in, in an underlying etiology. If we're saying this troponin elevation is an infarct, you would be able to see if it fits a regional territory of a, of a vascular bed. Potentially it was a major spasm and you can see a clear cut endocardial infarct. Alternatively, you could also um, entertain other non coronary related events. Um, and you would be able to do it with late gadolinium enhancement, which would give us an indication of scar. Prof mentioned already it would be important that this lady is going home with a secondary prevention ICD, um, but you would do that before the cardiac MRI. Scary case. So, yep, which in? MRI, ICD. Let's do some blood tests first. <laughs> Something simple. Is that okay? So we'll get uh, uh, Nasru to comment on the bloods this round. So she's got um, elevated white cell, uh, mild anemia, um, and she's actually got um, race. Uh, she's got hyper. She's got thyrotoxicosis. Yeah, elevated free thyroxine and, and a depressed TSH. Um, did we do any? Uh, was there any goiter on on physical examination? Any scans done? Not apparent. Okay, so. So, uh, thyrotoxic yeah, is heart disease, differential. So, how do we link all this? It certainly explains her weight loss if she's been uh, hyperthyroid for several months. Of course, iodine can precipitate a worsening of your thyroid function with the the iodine content of contrast, but the longevity of her symptoms would suggest this was preceding her presentation. So I would say hypothyroidism um, being a precipitant or a driver underlying her coronary spasm um, and treatment of that potentially would get a would, would, would cure her underlying mechanism. But I still think you would be considering uh, ICD. So maybe I hold that thought for a while because if you do make a diagnosis of, for example, a thyroid storm, participating in this event, uh, especially the total white is raised, and you do have mm -hmm. a thyroid toxic, uh, so the, like I said, the iodinated contrast can sometimes put them through this uh, trichoff kind of loop that can participate in a thyroid storm. Mm -hmm. And if you do make the diagnosis, then treating it with logos and all this will help. And you may be able to avoid ICD for a young patient. So that, that's one potential ask, but I'll defer to the endocrinologist here. Uh, any any other thoughts from Sydney or Rosley? Mm. So it's so so it's a Graves disease. I mean, you have to look at the eyes and things on the examination, and uh, especially skin and uh, all your thyroid antibodies. And uh, so I think I think that if it's confirmed, then I agree with Jack. Most likely, treating it uh, mean that you may not need if you have. As we said before, you had normal every function, pretty good coronary arteries. I think there's little need for, if that's the cause, maybe less need for a defibrillator. But that's a big discussion a little bit. Yeah. Just interested to find out the, the link of uh, thyrotoxicosis with uh, spasm. Uh, not sure whether that has been, I'm, I think, uh, which of you will be telling us afterwards, but uh, I've not really known the association with uh, spasm with uh, thyrotoxicosis. Let's see. Storm maybe, but not just pure thyrotoxicosis, I think. But which team are going to show us and educate us again? Yeah, so although the total white is elevated here, the poly is only 58%. It's probably some yeah. kind of uh, acute inflammatory response here, but certainly she's got uh, thyrotoxicosis here. So the diagnosis as uh, what uh, Rossley suggests is this is actually quite a well-described uh, uh, phenomena is a uh, thyrotoxicosis-related coronary artery spasm. Actually, this was first uh, reported uh, way back in 1950 clinically and then by angiography in 1979. Typically occurring in women, uh, 44 to 75, most commonly in the patients of Asian uh, ancestry. The time from the symptom onset to the diagnosis vary between days to months, so we don't know what is the time. They can have this spasm days or even months after the uh, Graves' disease. Sometimes the hyperthyroid manifestations may be scarce or absent, you know, presenting with uh, coronary artery spasm instead. The pattern of cardiac presentations uh, in this situation could include angina, 
myocardial infarction, cardiogenic shock, ventricular tachyarrhythmia, cardiac arrest, and pulmonary edema. So if you look at uh, multiple reports, uh, just looking at this Korean study of about 325 patients with spasm, of which eight patients have hyperthyroidism, all of them had complete resolution of symptoms with therapy. So once you control the thyrotoxicosis, this spasm goes away. So they all have excellent prognosis. The mechanism is unclear, but perhaps due to the enhanced sensitivity to stimuli such as the catecholamine. In fact, the, the coronary spasm therapy may be discontinued after six months of thyroid state. So, so this, is, uh, this is entirely due to the thyroid hormone. And when you look at people with spasm, and if they have concurrent uh, thyrotoxicosis, they present more often with higher incidence of acute myocardial infarction. But the long-term outcomes is the same once the thyroid uh, toxicosis is treated. So the clinical progress for these patients are GDNs, calcium channel blocker, extubated, uh, started on antithyroid therapy, radioiodine therapy six weeks later. But you know, when you treat coronary artery spasm, like, uh, like so someone was saying, uh, you need high dose of diotazem. You need maintenance nitrate therapy. Just that diotazem, 30 milligram BID and GDNPR is just not good enough. Actually, patients has got an ICD implanted, which I personally disagree. Uh, but anyhow, it was implanted because you know, people were worried about she presenting another time with a catastrophic event. But uh, whatever it is, this is thyrotoxicosis related coronary artery spasm. So Rusty, you're correct. Your hypothesis is correct. It's actually uh, well known. Yeah, but but, but I, I'm quite uh, intrigued because my thyrotoxicosis, I've never seen one with coronary spasm before. <laughs> That's what was... Now, the other question is, Shui Chim, if, if you know that its uh, mechanism is catecholamine induced, and we always give uh, beta blockers uh, you know, to uh, offset the sensitivity to catecholamines. So why not a beta block in this case? I think when you are dealing with a suspected uh, spasm here, beta blocker is probably not good. So particularly when you have initial uh, uh, evidence angiographically and, and ECG responding to GTN so dramatically, I'll, I'll be very cautious about giving beta blocker mm -hmm. therapy. <clears throat> Any other questions from uh, Sydney or the fellows? Yeah, I agree with Rosalie. I've seen lots of hyperthyroid thyrotoxic patients, so even a few storms, and I've never actually seen this much current spasm. It's a fascinating case. Thanks. Uh, by Chima, learned something there. Oh, very interesting. The fellows have any asks for this case? It's good. I, I Actually, I, I'm not certain about this uh, calcium channel versus beta blocker issue because classically we do give beta blockade in someone who is thyrotoxicosis. Uh, and uh, again, I, I don't know the literature enough to say in this category, is it better to use a calcium channel or add on the beta blockade here, although it's somewhat contraindicated for coronary vessel spasm. Um, which is that your last slide or yeah. some more teaching? <clears throat> yeah, I just want to say spasm uh, again, it's a very rare rare phenomena here. So most of the time, you're still going to give beta blocker. But once there's a suspicion of spasm, I think uh, perhaps a diotazem will be a, a better option. But uh, just be mindful that Graves' disease can rarely present with a cardiac arrest. Yeah, just, just for the dosing, you know, in the Inoka people, you know, Tom Ford and Colin Berry, et cetera, that diotazem dose in some of their patients is astronomically high. They've titrated people up to 600 milligrams a day. That's if you can tolerate it, but uh, very high doses of dutizem, even that's probably not enough for those spasm patients. So mm -hmm. that's 240, 360, but you know, still uh, not nearly enough. They go into over 500 milligrams. One thing was that you mentioned after achieving youth thyroid status, you could wean off and stop your anti spasm therapy. It would be interesting academically if you took this lady back six months after youth thyroid status, off her medications and see if she still had uh, provocation for coronary spasm. You would then consider acetylcholine challenge. And another option is if thought you disagree with the ICD implant, you could have used a, a temporary ICD, like a, a life vest, which is a one you wear around and it's not implanted for the period. Because I would certainly be anxious as that patient or their family to go home, trusting that I'm not going to have another cardiac arrest in that period where I'm still hyperthyroid but fantastic teaching case and i've never seen it before i loved it thank you 
I spoke to my electrophysiologist. It is possible to explant the ICD after, or if it is within six, 18 months or one and a half year, uh, because it's not fully endothelialized and so forth. So you could actually temporarily put in an ICD in somebody whom you think is just going to be here for short term coverage. And uh, yeah, to bring her back for a repeat angiogram and to stress her again, um, yeah, we'll, we'll let the primary physicians decide. But uh, in your data that you showed, it's very interesting because uh, the left main stem spasm was really markedly higher than, uh, you know, uh, tarotoxicosis with, uh, with the end spasm. So it's, it's, it's interesting to know because not many times that I really see uh, left main stem uh, spasm or diffuse spasm, uh, you know, unless, of course, it's all catheter induced. So a bit unusual. Hmm. Interesting. So, Rosalie, have you seen left bank compression from severe pulmonary hypertension? Yeah, yeah, I've I've seen the two cases uh, in just a space of just a month, and this was because of congenital heart disease where there's dilatation of the uh, pulmonary artery and it compresses left main. Uh, very interesting. I think Fauzi, Fauzi, you'll be seeing in Asia PCR uh, subsequently in in October that there's a case from Fauzi from Indonesia also detailing uh, spe- uh, compression of left main stem. And in those two cases, uh, we sent the left main and uh, the patient is quite stable. So I think something to just hold on the left main to be open. I was involved with a case many years ago, a uh, smoker, lady, actually female, with left main spasm. And, uh, and the angiogram you know, with nitro was very good. But then, uh, so you kept representing present the hospital and the arteries keep different calibers if, every time she had an angiogram. And I did an IVUS and said, look, that's, that's fine. There's no plaque there. And then, but she presented again and not an angiogram and they sent her to bypass surgery. And then she came again a few years later, a couple of years later. And of course the graph, lima graph is gone because, and there's, there's no disease there. And that's the problem with this sort of appearance on the angiogram and getting bypass surgery, uh, at least previously. So there's no plaque, just in the theater dysfunction, lots of vessel spasm. So there's a trap for players. And I think I've much more likely now give nitroglycerin when you see something like that, left main particularly to see if it's all spasm. Actually, uh, osteo left main compression from pulmonary hypertension was in my last uh, uh, episode. So if you're interested, you can go back and take a look as well. Okay, so we'll we're, we're come to 90 minutes. Uh, Huichim, again, I would like to thank you for your excellent spread of cases. Again, just, just uh, my same usual comments. I thank Wichim again for sharing his 25 years of experience presenting those teaching points. And more importantly, he showed us that every time you see a rare case, he doesn't just end there. He does a follow-up publication for all these cases to just spread the word and follow up with a teaching session like this. So thank him very much. I'll continue to look forward to further sessions. Thanks to my two professors here, Sydney and Rosley, and my two fellows who's always uh, looking to contribute. So again, I enjoy myself. I'm looking at more and more rare cases. It makes me think of something else every time I see an AMI now, but it's very good. So I don't miss anything at all. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who stayed throughout the 90 minutes and look forward to seeing you for the next session. Thank you very much and keep safe. Bye-bye. Thank you.